So I, I'd first like to just thank you again for inviting me to be here to share some of my thoughts and ideas. And, and I have to, in full disclosure, say these are not just my thoughts or just my ideas. Um, you heard mention that I work for the Association of American Colleges and Universities, and we are a member-based organization. We have 1,400 member institutions. That represents about a, a network of about 30,000 faculty, administrators, and other professional staff on college campuses, and it's really a grand network that we work with to work on different projects and programs. Now, our mission is twofold. One is to advance quality liberal education, regardless of major, regardless of discipline, and the second is inclusive excellence. So we want to make sure that we are working with member institutions to offer high quality learning for all students and to make sure that all students have access to those programs, not just access to the institutions, but access to high quality liberal learning. And so in my role at, at AAC and US, I spent a lot of time working with campuses and institutions across the nation and in other parts of the world to advance this mission and to learn what's going on, you know, on the, at those institutions. Um, in, in my own background, I, I worked as a faculty member and as an administrator at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, or IUPY, which was the urban campus for Indiana University and Purdue University. Um, so, you know, I'd like to talk at the beginning about some of the contested times that, that we're experiencing right now. Um, some have said these times are very fascinating. Some have said they're complex. Some people are tired of them. <laughs> you know, some said, why can't we just have some normalcy? Every day something is happening. Uh, something, you know, something traumatic seems to occur every other week. You know, all around the world, not just in the American context. And I think that's the important thing to think about is it's not just looking at the U.S., but looking around the world. And like some of you, you know, I've found myself in the last year and a half spending time rereading some text from other tumultuous periods in American history. And I've spent quite a bit of time rereading James Baldwin, mm -hmm. um, inspired, of course, by the film I Am Not Your Negro, and, and, you know, saying, oh, you know, I read Baldwin so many years ago, and what he has to say is so relevant today. Again, not just relevant in the U.S. context. And also, of course, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who is, is referenced, you know, quite often. Um, and I'd like to start with a reference from King when he talked about the fierce urgency of now. And he, his quote is this, we are faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. And when he said this, he was speaking in a time of great conflict and change. And he said that there was a revolutionary spirit around the world. He was particularly talking about Vietnam. Um, but others would argue that we've entered into a, a revolutionary period, if, if you don't mind me co-opting that phrase, um, around the world. You know, we, of course, many would say this was sort of kicked off by Brexit, um, that, that vote that most people didn't see coming in, in the UK. Um, it was followed by uh, nationalist movements in Poland and Hungary in particular, where you saw campaigns and elections. You saw increases in populist votes uh, with the right in, in Europe. And some have argued we saw it here in the US with the move to have executive orders to restrict the entrance of folks from predominantly Muslim countries from entering the US. Also around the world, we've seen examples of harassment of individuals based on color, based on religion, based on national origin and other factors. Um, one thing in particular that's interesting when we think about the US context, but it's also true around the world, is that there has been a real increase in hate crimes in metropolitan areas. Some of us who live in urban areas used to say, oh, that doesn't happen in urban areas. That's something that affects our rural communities. And I'm from Indiana, so I can embrace the rural and the urban <laughs> um, in, my, in, my, in my, my Hoosier homeland. Um, but we, as I said, we've seen increases across the board. And, and, and things are happening all across the nation, as you know, Earlier this summer, we're all familiar with the situation when the two men were killed in Oregon, when they tried to intervene, when the hateful rant was going on and, 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 and two were killed, one was wounded. Richard Collins III, of course, a Bowie State student, was killed not far from here in, in College Park in what is widely believed to be a hate crime. And what we found is that we are seeing headlines like these, the scope of hate, hate crimes are rising, Trump's election has created safe space, spaces for racists. And, you know, of course, safe space now has become a contested term. Um, but all of these things have been occurring over the past year and a half. And, and some would argue they've been happening for many, many years, but we're seeing them highlighted over the past year and a half. But the other thing that we're seeing, and I think it's important that we 
pause a little bit to think about this, is that we have students who are protesting and getting engaged in many, many issues that are global in nature. Um, so one example we have here, students at the University of Missouri um, who are protesting the treatment of students of color. We have students at the University of North Texas who were protesting issues of how the LGBTQ community was treated, as well as how Latino students were being treated on campus. Um, also, it goes to the issue of fair wages and students, not just at Tufts, but there were also students at many other institutions that were standing up and fighting for fair wages for workers on college campuses. So it wasn't just about the students. Also, Columbia University was just one example. Mount Holyoke and others were protesting where institutions were investing their funds and saying, it's time that we stop investing in the prison industrial complex. It's time that we stop investing in industries that are not advancing our nation. And so there were real strong pushes to get boards of trustees to stop investing in fossil fuels and other, other things. Now this, all, I'd like to pause here. These are students from San Francisco State University who went on a hunger strike when the budget for ethnic studies was cut at the university, at, at, at San Francisco State University. And we have the pleasure at AAC and you uh, to work closely with, with a number of institutions, but San Francisco State is one that we've spent, I've spent quite a, quite a bit of time working with them, and we actually invited their president to talk about some of these issues at our symposium last January. And he talked about the fact that his primary concern was not publicity, good or bad, was not if these students were on TV, was that the students were begin, being taken care of. And that how he could talk to the students about what is it that we can do to make sure if you're going on a hunger strike to make sure that you know, certain your nutritional needs are met, what can I do to help? Who can I help, who can I put in place to assist you? And when, when, when President Wong talked about this, we had a follow-up discussion where a lot of other faculty, graduate students, administrators and staff said the same thing. They said, you know, we're not immune to what's going on <laughs> outside. And we may want to, to step in and act as allies for students, but we don't know how to do it. We don't have the words. One person said, I'm a chemistry professor. I, I don't even know where to begin. And we started to have these discussions about what is it that we can do to help prepare faculty, staff, administrators, graduate students who are future faculty to address and deal with these issues. Of course, just a couple of weeks ago, we had the, the white supremacist attack in Charlottesville. The response from the Charlottesville commu community was a peaceful vigil. Um, but it's very interesting that the response immediately from presidents, from provosts, from associations and organizations was to denounce the violence and to come out immediately and say, this is wrong. So some of you may be familiar with the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors. They immediately issued the statement, we decry the violence, the discrimination, and the attempts, the attempts to intimidate, silence, and harm our students, educators, and community members. We reject racism and white supremacy. We stand with the students, educators, their families, and communities across the country working for equitable and welcoming environments where it is safe to exist, learn, and peacefully disagree and debate. And they were very deliberate with that last phrase and peacefully disagree and debate because that is what a liberal education prepares us to do is we don't want to get to the point where we say, oh, we're not going to discuss other perspectives. That's the opposite of what we want to do in times like this. And so we have followed the lead of organizations such as this. There was another incident that I referenced earlier, and that was, of course, the, the initial executive order to limit entrance into the country from folks from predominantly Muslim countries in the second. And in response to that, it was very, very similar. The president of Princeton University said, immigration has been a source of creativity and strength for this country throughout its history. It's indispensable to the mission and excellence of America's universities, which enhance this country's economy, security, and well-being. And in that same spirit, Institutions responded in kind with statements of support. They convened students to come together to say, what is it that we can do? How can we let you know that you're welcome? Temple University started the hashtag, you are welcome here, to make students feel welcome in the campus environment. Some say these are very superficial things, but they were efforts and acts to show students that, that they cared. One other thing that's interesting in response to the, the, the political environment in the US following the presidential election, following a, a number of other issues, is that several associations came together under the leadership of the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers. And they did a survey 
of international recruiters and international professionals who work with recruitment in other nations to talk about what is going on in other countries. What are people thinking about the US? What are graduate students and undergraduate students thinking who initially were thinking about coming to the US? And they noticed in the survey that they did that the highest percentage of concerns came from the Middle East, followed by India, Asia, and then Latin America. And the most frequently cited concern was the perception that the climate in the US had become less welcoming to individuals from other countries, which makes sense. Another concern was that the executive order travel ban, the initial, might expand to include other countries. And if they came here, what would happen to them if they were suddenly on the list? Now, the, the results are not 100% yet because most classes are just starting and we're finding things out. But yesterday in Inside Higher Ed, Elizabeth Redden reported an update from a few institutions. And she said there's no trend yet. But what she found, there were several institutions where they did see a decline, despite the fact that international student numbers had been going up. Um, Western Michigan had a 4% decline. Missouri State, a 10% decline. Indiana State University had 50%, a 50% drop in new international students, 20% across the board. And their decrease came from a wide range of countries. Also, the University of Florida had a decrease to just over 600 students. And the majority of the, that decline came at the graduate level, which is where they had seen high numbers of international students. However, not all students had a drop. NYU said their, their, their numbers increased by 1%. UCLA didn't anticipate changes. And University of Illinois actually said they were expecting more students. So time will tell what the actual impact will be with this new social political climate. But it's important that we're aware that these things are going on. Now, yesterday, two things happened. One, I'm sure everyone is very familiar with, and I'll start with the, the one that you may or may not have heard. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the European Union, Union's high court ruled that the eastern states in the EU must take refugees. Slovakia and Hungary had gone to court to say, we don't feel like we should have to take any more refugees. What is going on? The EU high court said, yes, that is something that all EU member nations have to do. The second thing, I'm sure you're all very familiar that happened here in the US, was that the DACA decision, it, it was decided by, it, that DACA would end in six months. And much like the other issues I discussed, we had a lot of response from our higher education community. Of course, DACA's deferred action for childhood arrivals. I think many of you are familiar with that statement. Um, one of our local colleges, Trinity College, their president focused on the fact that she would be publicly advocating for those students. And she wanted her colleagues to meet with the Dreamers as a group and talk about their collective concerns. Cal State Fullerton and many universities in, in California have offices that were dedicated to DACA students. And, and in some other parts of the country as well, that's the case. And they said for them it was important to tell students that you, your status as a student isn't contingent on DACA, so we are going to continue to support you. And then uh, finally, Notre Dame's president, uh, Reverend John Jenkins, said that it was foolish, cruel, and un-American, and that Notre Dame would continue to support DACA students financially and maintain their enrollment, even if Congress fails to act. Some of you also heard from the business community. Of course, the, uh, the chairman of uh, Microsoft also said that he would do the same thing. He was vigorously going to fight this. And so I think it's important that we start with these examples and we start with where we are before we dive into a discussion about how we can advance global literacy and global learning because all of these issues are global in nature. Migration, immigration is an issue that's impacting people all over the world. Sustainability, environmental issues impact the world. Um, issues of nationalism, those are things that are affecting all of us. And so I think it's important that we just take a minute to think about where we are as a nation, where we are as a world, and what those issues are. So with the remainder of my time, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about why we should do this work. Why does global learning matter? Why is global literacy something that you're here to talk about at 4 o'clock on a, a Wednesday on a short work week? Um, what is global learning? What are some definitions of it? What's happening on other campuses? I'm going to share some data from Nessie. And then I want to talk about some thematic global learning and global learning outcomes that you may apply to your own courses. Um, to your own advancement of global issues on campus. So first, um, just feel free to raise your hand for whatever, whatever response is appropriate. Could be one, could be two, could be. Who are the drivers of this work? Raise your hand if you would say accreditors are driving this push for global literacy. Okay, 
All right, thank you. Raise your hand if you think the community, the parents, family members, your local community expects this. Okay, good. Employers, this is something coming from employers. Okay, thank you. Um, the nation, as, 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 a, as a, 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 a member or someone who lives, a citizen or is working in the U.S., the U.S. is pushing for this. Okay, and that has changed, okay, some would argue. Okay, and, <laughs> and the world, the world wants this. Okay, thank you. All right, and so you're correct. All the answers are correct, um, but I want to spend a little bit of time. <laughs> that was an easy one. No, <laughs> they will get harder um, with the accreditors, and I think this is something that we're finding that more and more accrediting agencies are including dimensions of global learning, global literacy, intercultural competence in the language in terms of what's expected of students. So one example is social work. So when you look at the Council on Social Work Education, they're encouraging students to engage diversity and difference in practice, not just being aware of it, but in your practice. How does diversity and difference operate? And to understand how diversity characterizes and shapes the human experience and the intersectionality of immigration status, ethnicity, color, and religion. So that's coming from the Council on Social Work. ABET from Engineering is another group that for years they've had this expectation of an awareness of intercultural competence and awareness of global perspectives. And they want students to function in multidisciplinary teams to be able to create and offer engineering solutions in global, economic, and different, inverse, di different environmental contexts. Nursing, of course, is also another field where nurses are expected to be able to practice in culturally and ethnically diverse societies. That's practicing here in the U.S., not meaning you have to go and practice outside the country. Um, and there's also the expectation that nurses will have experiences and understanding from regional, national, and global perspectives. And finally, even in business, the business accreditors want business students to be able to deal with subjects that are global in nature, that relate to the global workplace and other aspects of global society. So what about what employers want? And I want to share this. You can see these on here. Thank you. So I'm going to share a bit of data from an employer survey. So one, uh, one of the, 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 the many things that AACNU does is we do surveys with employers to talk about some of the, the outcomes that we think are of value to see if that's what employers also think is valuable. So in, uh, at the end of 2014, we had this survey. We did it with Hart Associates. And one of the things that they told us, and this is relevant for all of us, is that 70% of employers reported being globally connected. The other thing that employers said when we said, how, are, how is your work globally connected? 41% said they had operations outside the US. 49% said they had suppliers outside the U.S., and 54% said they had clients. So you may be making calls to someone who is in a different country. You may have to understand how to interact with someone who is working and functioning in a different environment. Um, I'll give you, you one quick example, and this is not an example to say that all Kenyans do this, because that is not the case. Um, but in it, 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 my previous institution, we had a, a pretty in-depth in partnership with the university in Kenya. Um, and we were relying a lot on email. Many of us travel to Kenya frequently, so we were working on projects and things together. But we also relied on email. And one of our colleagues, and again, this was about 15 years ago, one of them said, you realize when you send email, that means as much as gossip. Because email was not an official way to communicate at that particular institution. And so it was something we had to be aware of because we thought, hey, we're putting all this down. And then we get there and people are like, oh, you know, we didn't pay attention to that. So it's something that you have to be aware of when you're working with people in other cultures. What does this mean and what does this matter? Even if you never leave the country. As I said, we had several folks on our campus that never went to Kenya, but they were involved in this work. Another thing that's interesting to look at is that they said that they wanted all students to gain global learning and intercultural skills. So not just the students that were liberal arts majors, not just the students that were going to be teachers, or not just the students that were going to do area studies, but they said that all students needed to have these global and intercultural skills. 96% said that all students should have experiences solving problems with people whose views are different from their own. This is a critical one because you hear it time and time again. It's not just our employer survey. We hear it in research done by many other people. Employers want them to be able to say when they come in for an interview, okay, give me that example, not do you think you can do it, but how did you do it? How did you work with people? What were the different perspectives that you brought together? 
Another thing, again, that shows this is important for all students is that 78% agreed or strongly agreed that regardless of the field of study, they needed to gain intercultural skills and an understanding of societies and countries outside the U.S. So you may be a student who is studying law, but you need to have an understanding of what's going on in other parts of the country. And lastly, with the employer data, is they said that students were particularly unprepared on five outcomes. The first doesn't surprise you, problem solving in diverse groups. They said students were not ready to do this. Scientific literacy. The third, knowledge of global developments. Fourth, knowledge of cultures and societies outside the US. And last, foreign language proficiency. And some have argued, well, we can't do much about foreign language proficiency. It's not required in my major, or it's not required in my field. And we've had a number of conversations with, with institutions that are looking at finding ways to add language programs. Now, I, I want you to, this is going to be a very, very quick, just what do you think? So take 15 seconds and, and think about this. So this is a, a colleague of mine from the Gates Foundation, um, shared this with me and I, and, and I, every time I look at it, I, I think differently. But their logic in, in what she found is that when you think about the public perception of higher education, that in prior to World War II, higher ed was seen as a luxury. After World War II, it became a privilege. 65 to 90, it became an opportunity. 1990 to 2009, it became a necessity. And in 2009, roughly, it became a right. Um, so raise your hand if, if you think education today, the public perception today, is that higher ed is a luxury. Okay, a privilege, okay, a luxury. So we still have four, okay, thank you. And that's, that's an argument that we, that I go back and forth. Okay, privilege, higher ed is a privilege today. Okay, a few, okay, three or four. An opportunity. Okay, a necessity. Okay, so we have a clustering there, and then a right. Anybody thinks higher ed is a right? Just a handful. Okay, all right. So I think we have to sort of figure out where we are and what we believe in terms of how we start advocating and talking to folks about higher education. Because sometimes we have conversations with people that think it's a luxury, and we talk to them as if it's a right. <laughs> or we talk to them as if it's a necessity, and we're operating in different realms. So it's important that we think about these things, and this is something you can take time. Now, this is probably something you haven't thought as much about. And forgive, I use a Mac, so sometimes things will appear differently than they should. So d don't mind that little part that's below the blue. Um, but when you think about global learning now, right now, and this can be what you think, raise your hand if you think of global learning, and I know I haven't given you the definition, that's next, but if you think of global learning as a luxury. Okay, so we got a few. Okay, thank you, a few, four brave souls, five, okay. If you think of it as a privilege, Okay, two, three, four, three, okay. If you think of it as an opportunity for students. Okay, so okay, we're filtering a little bit. If you think of it as a necessity. Okay, so some clustering there. And does anybody think global learning is a right? Somebody's with me, okay, all right. I think it's a right that we owe students, okay. And, and again, this is another conversation that you have to have to decide how are we going to advocate, how are we gonna move this forward? If we all feel that it's a luxury, are we going to invest time and resources to make sure that faculty have time to, in, to integrate this? Are we going to make sure that all of our academic advisors know about this and advance it? No. But if we feel that it's a necessity or a right or perhaps an opportunity, then that also shifts the discussion. So this is something else that it's interesting to discuss and to talk about. So very, very quickly, I'm going to give you a, a brief history of international education and global learning in, in two minutes. So, in the 1980s, you start seeing the term internationalization emerging and being a term that's used pretty re regularly. Jay Knight is the person who has, is given the credit for coining the term and doing most of the early theorizing about it. And internationalization is simply how an institution goes about integrating international or intercultural perspectives and dimensions into the teaching, research, and service mission of the university. So this is when we start thinking comprehensively of, okay, so we're going to have students going and coming. We're going to have faculty going and coming. We're going to start counting the courses. How many, how many world language classes do we have? How many students that we have from this country or that country? So this is when you start seeing universities developing offices of international affairs or offices of international education. And so there's a, a shift there. And then next, you start seeing in the literature this term global citizenship. 
And this is about preparing students for engagement in diverse and global contexts. And so this is when we start thinking about what is it that students should be able to do to thrive and to function in society. Um, many of you probably remember reading something by Martha Nussbaum at some point in your, your academic history or some point you will read if you haven't already. But she has written about this term called the narrative imagination. And she argues that this is what allows you to have an ability to see the world through the eyes of others. And this is what allows me, someone who grew up north of Indianapolis, to imagine what it would be like for someone living in Hawaii to experience different events. Or me growing up in a suburban area north of Indianapolis to imagine what it's like for someone in a rural community. So I'm able to try to understand the perspectives of others, even if the perspectives are very, very different from my own. And so Nussbaum argues that in order for us to be active, responsible members of society, we should be able to think about the perspectives of others as we move forward. And so this is one thing that has guided some arguments about global citizenship. Now global perspectives, Larry Braskamp has done a lot of work in this area, and this, he argues that you think about, one, how do I know? So when I say I know something, how do I know it? Where do I get the information? Who do I trust? How do I vet that information? And so that's one phase. Then who am I? Hmm, who am I? How do I describe myself? How do I see myself? Or how do I think people see me? And third, how do I relate to other people? So what is my responsibility to the broader society? What is it that I'm contributing to people in my classes, to people in my community? And so he argues that when you think about these three areas, that helps start to shape your global perspective. The last example as we get to global learning is this concept of intercultural competence. And this is something I'm sure many of you are familiar with from your coursework um, and from other work that you've done. And this, many people are saying, we should focus on intercultural because it works at the intersection of international and multicultural. And so it gets to the point where we think about how are we able to communicate effectively, to function effectively in a variety of situations. And so Darla Deardorff, who I've learned, you might hear from her soon, um, she has written a lot about uh, intercultural competence. And with some of my study abroad programs and with some of my um, service learning programs, I used a couple of her instruments, so I'm happy to, to talk about those during the Q&A if you want to talk further. So this brings us to global learning. You're thinking, oh, we're finally there, right? <laughs> but before I say what it is, <laughs> I, I want to say it's very, very important, and you, you've already heard this, that everyone at the institution has the same understanding and the same definition of what global learning is. So when you're in one course, when you're with one advisor, when you're in one building, they hear the same thing. And that is how you can move this forward. Also, the definition for curricular experiences should be the same definition that you use for co-curricular experiences. So students are able to put the experiences they're having that are, that are related to their education for credit, not for credit, together and understand how things come together. So the definition of global learning should define what it is and it should describe what students are able to do. So um, AACNU's definition of global learning, and this is on the document that you have, um, this definition was developed by about 40 people initially from, all from a variety of disciplines. Um, there were faculty, staff, other administrators who came together and developed this definition. So the definition, global learning is a critical analysis of an engagement with complex interdependent global systems and legacies and their implications for people's lives and the earth's sustainability. So raise your hand if this definition would not work in your discipline. Okay, so no one's hand is up, perhaps because you're digesting, but I'll, I'll, I'll take it that you see how it can fit. And the reason that we had people from a wide range of disciplines right, is because from our perspective, global learning is not area studies. Global learning is something that it's a skill that we want all of our students to have. It's a, it's a form of liberal education. And so we wanted a definition that could be put on any program. So, um, you know, I taught international and global studies, so it's a natural fit. But one of my colleagues, who's a historian, would this work in her courses? And she was able to find that it did. So one other definition that I'll share with you, and this is also on your handout, um, are from some of our colleagues at Florida International University. 
Um, and they are in our thoughts right now because they're right now in the, the, the line of, of uh, Hurricane Irma. And um, we actually just was on a Skype call with them. And the definition that they developed in their particular context was that global learning is the process of diverse people collaboratively analyzing and addressing complex problems that transcend borders. Now, they chose this definition because for them, global learning is diversity. And they, they are located in Miami. And so they said, students on our campus are inherently global <laughs> because they are in this major metropolitan area that is very global. Uh, obviously, a lot of folks from Latin America, but there are, are folks from all over the world when you look at the investment. So this is another definition that you can take a look at and, and think about what, what would it mean to be globally literate. So when we think about global learning opportunities and developing global learning experiences or you think about reflecting on the global learning that you may have or how you can make sure that you integrate a global perspective, one is you want to make sure that there are meaningful opportunities to analyze complex problems and global challenges. So when you see an issue, you think about it from the global perspective, but you also think about it from the, the local. Another thing is that you need to be able to apply learning to take responsible action in contemporary global context. So for us, this is an action um, step. Another thing, and many people who have had experience, experiences with communities that are very different from their own talk about this almost immediately when they come out of these immersive experiences, is this ability to enhance your identity, your community um, perspective, and your personal ethics. And again, this comes up time and time again, collaborating respectfully with diverse others. And then realizing that the world is interdependent and it's also inequitable and realizing that and that higher education has a role to play in, in, in this. So what are some examples of global learning activities? These are things that you all know. What are some examples of global learning here at UMB? You can just shout them out. Okay. Service Experiential trip. service trips, okay. You research. do search. research, so you do research related to a global topic. Interprofessional global okay, interprofessional global projects, excellent. Globally focused capstones. Okay, globally focused capstones, very good. Other things that you do here? Comparative studies. Comparative studies, excellent. So you're able to, yeah, you draw those conclusions. Okay, any other examples? Community engagement center activities there. Okay, perfect. Community engaged learning, excellent. That's another example. Mm -hmm. There's a um, global health certificate. Okay, so global health certificate. So you are focused on global health issues. So many of these things you're already doing, but it's a matter of how do we pull them together and how do we decide what is important for students and where does this count? Do we need a certificate? Do we need a required course? Do we need to make sure that students have multiple opportunities across the curriculum? And that's sort of the next step for you to decide where you want to go from here. The, the main thing, if you remember nothing else that I say today, <laughs> which might be the case, no, <laughs> you no know, one say no, 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 um, is that global learning cannot be achieved with a single course or a single experience, but it's acquired cumulatively across that student's entire college experience. So even if you have sort of the 101 global course, which is good because you're getting that framing, students have to have opportunities to practice their sophomore year, their junior year, their senior year, that first semester, second semester, third semester of their graduate program, you have to have multiple opportunities to engage in this type of work. 